Right, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me out here. It's actually nice to be here from Winnipeg, where you're in the throes of the polar vortex. <laughs> so <laughs> this is actually balmy weather for me right now. <laughs> so um, it's nice to be here in Edmonton because I'd like to talk about our organization, the Chronic Disease Innovation Center, because I think what we do actually ties in really well with the whole health city ecosystem. So a little bit about CDIC, and not to be confused with the Canadian Deposit Insurance Corporation, by the way. <laughs> Not the greatest choice of an, of an abbreviation, but it is what it is. So our mission is to use sophisticated data analysis to predict risk and to model and evaluate improved processes of treatment to chronic disease care. Now, when people think of a research center, they often think of lab coats and safety goggles and test tubes and microscopes, but we're not that type of research center. We're actually focused and interested in data and specifically how we can use data to improve the health of our patients, reduce healthcare costs, bring new healthcare technologies to market, and we provide this data research by working with experts in a variety of public and private sector fields. So a group of kidney specialists were the catalyst to launch this organization in 2015. And our principal investigators are affiliated with the University of Manitoba, and they do clinical work at Seven Oaks Hospital in Winnipeg, where we're based. However, the CDIC is governed by a volunteer board appointed by the Seven Oaks Hospital Foundation. We're also integrated with the Wellness Institute, which is a state-of-the-art medical fitness facility whose model has been replicated in China many times over. But we operate as an independent nonprofit organization. And with the help of community donors, we finally got our own space in 2017. And since then, we've already doubled our staff and our revenue, which tells me that there's a real market out there for the types of work that we do. And we couldn't do what we do without a multidisciplinary team of staff and collaborators who have expertise in epidemiology and biostatistics, health economics, clinical trials, health technology such as home monitoring and point of care testing, and patient partnerships. As much as possible, we are about including patient feedback in our research from study design all the way to knowledge translation. And one of the biggest parts of what we do is working with large administrative data sets. Now, from a research perspective, we're actually very fortunate in Canada that we have a single-payer healthcare system because it allows us to access multiple provincial databases for research at a population level. And that's not something that a lot of countries have. Now, it varies from province to province that what's available to researchers. In Manitoba, we have access to a wide array of data that's all housed at the Manitoba Center for Health Policy. I know in Alberta, also, lots of rich data sets. And one advantage is that you have a single health authority, which means less approval process, which I'll get into later. <laughs> now, individual level data can be linked through a personal health ID number and scrambled through a secret algorithm for privacy reasons to prevent, pre prevent identification. Now, at CDIC, we're actually one of the few research institutions that can access the Manitoba Center for Health Policy terminal remotely. And what's unique about our corporate structure is that we can work very flexibly in the industry world. One big issue with a number of provincial repositories is that they don't have that flexibility. And we may be a small province, but our statistical power um, is enhanced because our data actually goes far back as the 1980s in many cases. And there's also some federal institutions like the Canadian Institute for Health Information where you can obtain Canada-wide data for things like hospitalizations and organ replacements. Now, being an organization that works with big administrative data comes with its successes and challenges. And it forces you to develop some very valuable core competencies that aren't just associated with research. A big portion of that is project management. And that comes with navigating the research ethics process, putting together contracts so it satisfies both your clients and your data providers. Now, in a short period of time, our principal investigators have authored or co-authored nine publications in peer-reviewed journals where big data from Manitoba was used, and it has led to local, national, and even international collaborations that otherwise would not have been possible. Now, some challenges are the length of time it takes just to get the data. Frequently, it takes longer than six months to get the data from the time you've officially obtained your funding or executed your contract, which can be frustrating to researchers and clients alike. Now, I've learned in Alberta that the process is a lot more streamlined, which is great, something that we can learn from. Now, part of the reason, I think, for it takes some time to get the data is a lack of a centralized data acquisition process. Now, oftentimes, you're required to send several different applications to several different agencies, and sometimes they require approval from each other at the same time. Yeah, very frustrating. So surely that's something that could be streamlined a lot better. And also crunching data sets with millions of records can take a long time and constant computing upgrades might be required for efficiency's sake. Now at CDIC, we do projects with both the public and private sector. And there are some important differences to keep in mind. 
So if it is a public sector grant, like CIHR, you have to hold the money at your academic institution with where you are affiliated. And that comes with restrictions in order to comply with grant regulations. Whereas if it's a contract with private industry, you have to hold the money yourself. And although the funding is based on a budget, the funds are much less restricted. And when your money is held at an academic institution, the contract process goes through them. Otherwise, it'll go through us. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages to both ways. If the university legal department takes over the contract process, it's less work and lower cost for us, but then we also have less control over the process and delays are likelier. Either way, there are some extra fees because automatic overhead charges are built into public sector grants, whereas the data providers and university research ethics boards may charge review to review contracts with industry. And you also have to keep in mind the legal fees that you have to pay for your own counsel. And finally, with grants, you get a predefined lump sum payment, sometimes for several years which is easier for budgeting, whereas oftentimes payments with industry contracts are milestone-based. So you can see how an extra layer of complication is added when you are a research institution who is interested in working in data with both the public and private sector. So I'd like to give some examples of what we do by presenting some case studies of both our public and private sector projects. Now, one of our investigators, Dr. Nav Tangri, has developed something called the kidney failure risk equation. And this is an algorithm that uses laboratory and demographic data to predict your probability of needing dialysis within two or five years. And this fits in perfectly with part of the CDIC's mission to use sophisticated data analysis to predict risk. Now, some kidney clinics around the world, including us at Seven Oaks, use it for managing referrals from primary care and as a way to present risk to patients regarding whether they need dialysis. You know, it's very effective at aligning resources with risk. And it has been validated with approximately 90% accuracy in 30 countries across four continents and hundreds of thousands of patients. But in order to um, continue using it in Manitoba, we needed to uh, test its accuracy in Manitoba to see if it worked in our patient population. And to do that, we received funding from the Manitoba Medical Service Foundation to test its accuracy in Manitoba as part of a deliverable from the Manitoba Center for Health Policy to the government on the state of kidney disease in our province. So government reports like these are not possible without access to accurate and timely population level data. So we needed to gather the demographic, laboratory, primary care, and hospitalization records from all Manitoba adults to retrospectively apply the equation to see how well it predicted dialysis use five years later. And the results showed that it was just as accurate in Manitoba as in other cohorts. And this resulted in a publication in the Canadian Journal of Kidney Health and Diseases. We've also collaborated with an international team of investigators organized by AstraZeneca for a landmark observational study that compared a new diabetes drug called SGLT2 inhibitors with other diabetes drugs to see whether, as seen in clinical trials, they reduce the risk of heart failure and other cardiovascular outcomes in real world settings. Now, there are many organizations out there that are very interested in population level data sets to research real world effectiveness of drugs because clinical trials don't necessarily reflect a real world setting of an actual patient population and true adherence to medication. So it's yet another example of how valuable population level health data is. And with some meetings yesterday, I learned of the real world effectiveness consortium in Alberta. So I feel like um, in Alberta, you're well on your way to realizing the potential of this data. Now we received funding to obtain Manitoba data. So we conclude it in an analysis along with Korea, Japan, Australia, and Israel. And when we did that, we looked at all the prescription drug, hospitalization, demographic, laboratory records of Manitoba adults with diabetes to see whether these drugs showed real world results that were similar to what was found in randomized trials. And the results were positive and resulted in a publication in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Now the CDIC is still young, but it's growing and we have a lot of ambition. Some of our future directions in the world of data include collaborating with others to build a data warehouse with access to real-time health data to improve clinical decision-making and patient care, participating in a committee to streamline the data acquisition process to continue to develop local, national, and international collaborations. And we're also in the process of working with other types of data, like workers' compensation board or auto insurance. These are different provincial level data sets that are not health data, but they can be linked with health data to answer all sorts of research questions. Now, this session was called Opening the Door to the World, Health Innovation Powered by Data. And we learned that the most effective way for an organization to achieve this is to have an in-house multidisciplinary team. Now, when analysts, economists, clinicians, and research coordinators are all connected to and learn from each other, you are more likely to all be on the same page for research context, process, and content. 
It's also important to continue to nurture an ecosystem of diverse stakeholders, and I can see that Health City is doing a great job with that. And finally, realizing that accessing population-based health data is a unique value we have in Canada to author for academic research. And I think that um, we need to do a better job in leveraging that uh, Canada-wide. Some of the provinces are still working too much in their own silos, and they need to do a better job of combining their data sets. So it's important to uh, make the data acquisition process as efficient as possible for researchers. Now I'd like to thank Health City again for inviting me here to share the story with you for our CDIC organization. And before we get to the, the q and I just want to quickly plug our website and our Twitter page. Thank you.